again, good morning. And I know I, I've begun, begun saying this every Sunday of how humbling it is to be able to open the word of the Lord with you. I have to say it's especially humbling this morning. Uh, in fact, uh, if I'm being fully honest uh, in true confession, uh, our gospel reading this morning is not one that, that I wanted to preach on. Uh, in fact, I did my, my best to uh, wiggle myself out of it, uh, to try to, to, to justify to myself why I didn't need to deal with it. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't have to preach on the gospel reading. I could preach on the, uh, the Genesis reading. I don't have to preach the lectionary at all. I could preach something else that would be much better this, this Sunday, uh, you know, or pick something else. Uh, why did I feel this way? <laughs> Well, if you listen to the gospel ring at all, I think you know why. It's a tough, tough topic to deal with. It's definitely not comfortable. Uh, and I much prefer the, the positive and the comfortable. Uh, so I came up with every excuse I could think of in my mind to justify it and to avoid it. Uh, but as I sought the Lord and as I really worked through this, this passage, the, the Lord convicted my heart about that. Because I think the real reason that I didn't want to preach on it is because I don't, in my heart of hearts, want to offend anyone. I don't want anyone to be upset with me. Uh, because in my heart of hearts, what I really want is your approval. I, I want you to like me and accept me and be happy with me because that's what makes me feel good about myself uh, and makes me feel like I'm then a worthy pastor. Uh, at first glance, the, this reading, uh, I just couldn't see how I could spin it in such a way to accomplish all of that. But, it, but as I dug deeper, you know, however unwillingly, uh, however unwillingly I dug into it, into our reading this morning, the Lord convicted me, me because it really what was going on inside my own heart, uh, that need to, to, to seek approval of, of others, uh, my propensity to find uh, my self-worth and what others think of me uh, is exactly really what's going on at the core of this gospel reading this morning. And furthermore, it's not just my issue. Uh, it's all of our issue. It's all of our issue because it's out of that desire for the approval of others uh, that springs forth our insatiable need to justify things and to make excuses for the things that we fail to do in our lives. So, you know, being human in some ways means we have this desire deep down inside of us that longs for approval, either approval from other people approval from even ourselves, uh, and ultimately the approval of God. It's what we're longing to, to receive. Because when we are approved of, it then gives us that sense of validation, that we're then really worth something. Uh, we then are important. We're, we're of great worth. And so when we do something that other people disapprove of or something that we disapprove of ourselves or think God disapproves of, we immediately go into the self-justification mode, don't we? Uh, we just, it's just what we do. You know, well, I had to do it this way because fill in the blank, <laughs> you know, fill in the blank. And when we fail to do something we should or something that people expect of us or something we believe God expects of us, then we make excuses for why we didn't, Right? <laughs> So we justify the things that we do uh, that we shouldn't have done, and then the things that we failed to do, we just make excuses for why we didn't, uh, we didn't do it. Uh, but they're really the same thing. Excuses and justifications, they, they spring from the same source. They're an attempt to self-justify our actions or inactions so that we can get the approval that we're so desperately longing for, so that we can feel good about ourselves and perpetuate the illusion that we really don't have any problems. At least not as much as the next guy, right? Uh, so at great risk of gaining your disapproval this morning, uh, and possible even rejection, I invite you to open your Bibles or your bulletins uh, as we work through this gospel reading uh, together. In verse 1, this is what we're told. And Jesus left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again and again, as was his custom he taught them. 
You know, last week we looked at the last part uh, of Mark chapter 9. Jesus was with his disciples in Capernaum uh, along the northern shores of the Galilee. Uh, Jesus is now moving closer and closer and closer to Jerusalem. Everything that happens in Mark's gospel from here on out is Jesus making his way to the cross. You know, Jesus had never visited this uh, particular region before, at least not according to the, the gospel accounts that we have, but his, uh, his renown, his fame had already spread to that area, so much so that when he got there, crowds came out. They came out to see him. They had heard of him. And the reason is because back in Mark chapter 3, we're told that people from beyond the Jordan where Jesus is now, had come to see him before. And what they experienced when they had come to see him before was the great healings he had done. He was casting out demons from people. Uh, and, and so the word spread back to uh, in their own region. And when Jesus came, they wanted to come and see him. They wanted to experience Jesus for themselves. Uh, one other bit of information that's important also about this area that's especially pertinent to, to what Jesus is about to get into in just a moment. This is the area where John the Baptist taught uh, and ministered uh, to God's people. This was the region that was governed by Herod the, the Tetrarch. Uh, and John was openly critical about Herod's relationship with Herodias. And Herodias, if, if you don't remember in the gospel accounts, was uh, Herod's brother's wife. And that being so critical of that relationship is what got John arrested uh, and then later led to his own beheading. It's important to note because it's directly connected to what's about to happen next. While Jesus was teaching the crowds, we're told in verse 2, the Pharisees came up and in order to test him, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? For those who might not remember, the Pharisees are, are that group of, of Jewish uh, religious leaders who are experts in the Mosaic Law. Uh, they're also experts in the oral traditions of the rabbis that, uh, that added more laws and regulations on top of those. Uh, they're the law keepers, the regulators in Israel. Uh, the Apostle Paul was uh, one of the chief among the Pharisees. Jesus tangled with them numerous times during his ministry. But notice their motivation for coming to Jesus. It wasn't just to have a good-hearted discussion uh, or to have a debate about this issue. We're told they were testing him. They brought this up in order to test him, meaning that they were putting Jesus on trial. Uh, they were trying to entrap him uh, and, and using his own words against him, uh, something that would get him in trouble with Herod. Just the way John the Baptist had gotten in trouble. Presumably, but he might meet the same fate. Because let's be honest, the Pharisees at this point don't like Jesus at all. Uh, it has not gone well between them. The question they ask, though, has to do with whether or not the law of God permits a man to divorce his wife. That's what they asked. Well, as most of these interactions go, uh, before Jesus answers their question, uh, he has a question first for them. And Jesus asked them this in verse 3, what did Moses command you? To which they replied by citing from Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. Mo they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to, uh, and to send her away. Now, it's important to note that this uh, passage they're quoting from, Deuteronomy 24, 1, it was in first century Judaism generally held as the definitive authority on divorce. And, and to read it to you in full, that verse, this is what Deuteronomy 24, uh, verse 1 says. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if she, then, if, if, he then, if she then finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. You see why I didn't want to preach on this this morning? The only dispute in the first century uh, among the, the Jews was what that little word indecency meant. They weren't sure. And so there were two different camps among them as to what it meant. Uh, one of the camps said it meant a moral failure or a failure to follow the, the Jewish law, that that was grounds. Uh, the second camp said, yes, moral failure, but 
then it added to that, anything that caused annoyance or embarrassment to the husband was grounds for divorce. <laughs> Whew. <laughs> I'll just let that sink in there. But let's be clear here. The Pharisees didn't really answer the question that Jesus asked at all. Jesus asked, what did Moses command you? What did he command you? Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 isn't a command. It's not a command. It does not set out to answer the question whether divorce is right or wrong, which is basically what's being asked here. Uh, it's what the Pharisees are asking Jesus. The Mosaic law in Deuteron Deuteronomy 24.1 was actually a contingency that Moses had handed down uh, to protect women who had been repudiated by their husband. Deuteronomy 24.1 uh, does not command or even permit divorce, but rather see it serves as a regulation in situations after a divorce has happened, after it's been duly certified. But the Pharisees were using this provision as a justification for divorce, meaning how a person can go about divorcing and still be considered right with God. That's what they were putting forth. This is why Jesus answered them this way in verse 5. Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. In other words, the provision was given to help mitigate and to, or to regulate the hardness of heart of God's people. Jesus, therefore, links divorce to a practice that stems from the hardness of people's hearts. The hardness of people's hearts is just another way uh, that the Bible speaks of sin. It's a hardness of heart. It's a rebellion against God. But a hardness exactly towards what? What specifically is Jesus telling them that this provision was put in there uh, in order to regulate your hardness of heart? Jesus explained it in verses 6 through 9. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. See, the Pharisees looked to the regulation of Deuteronomy, uh, which at its best tolerated divorce, but did not authorize it as a, a justification for the practice and an acceptance of it. But Jesus goes back to God's creative purposes as the authority when it comes to all questions regarding marriage, how we're to understand it, how we're to hold it. Jesus quoted from Genesis 1, verse 27, and from uh, chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 24, that we heard this morning. Then what Jesus is saying is that these are the passages that have authority and primacy over this, uh, this tolerance that Deuteronomy 24 uh, provides. Before Adam and Eve fell in rebellion against God and sin had entered into the world, into the human heart, this is what God's plan for marriage was. This was God's creative intention for what marriage was to be about. God's created purpose was, and therefore the authority on marriage is, that humans were created male and female. The division of the sexes gets resolved by God through marriage. The two shall become one flesh. And marriage, the third thing, marriage is about a lifelong mutual fidelity to one another. What God has joined together, let no man separate. This is God's purpose, and this is God's authority concerning marriage. But in a fallen and a sinful world, in our hardness of heart towards God's purposes, we've twisted it. We've twisted it. We normalize divorce uh, while uh, lifelong fidelity has become the exception. But we make attempts to then justify ourselves and to come up with all the reasons and all the excuses as to why divorce is okay and should be the norm. The Pharisees were justifying themselves by improperly citing Deuteronomy 24.1. We justify ourselves or make excuses as a way of normalizing, let's be frank, what our own wants and desires really are. We, tr we twist God's creative purpose to fit our own wants and desires. That's what sin really is. 
It's us twisting God's creative purposes. Our attempt to recreate the world in our image in a way that suits us, in a way that conforms to our wants and our desires and our longings. It's not just with divorce. We do it with all of God's created purposes. God said, be fruitful and multiply. We say, now, it's irresponsible to have more than, what, one or two children, if that's even uh, loving the, the, the earth enough. God created us in his image, yet uh, with every person who has worth and dignity, yet we place value on certain people over other people. We pick and choose those who have value in our culture, in our society. Male and female, God created them. Well, we, we determined that gender is just some sort of pro, uh, object of, uh, of evolutionary chance, and therefore we're free uh, to be able to define for ourselves what gender we want to be. God created man to work the garden. That's what we see in God's created purpose. And yet we work for the weekends. Or we work for retirement. Seeing leisure as being what we were really created for and what we're really longing for. We twist God's creative purposes so that they're just more convenient to our own desires and our own wants. That's what's going on here with this particular topic of divorce. Because Jesus goes on to teach more about it in verses 10 through 12. And in the house, the disciples asked Jesus again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. The squirming continues. It's getting hot up here. You know, according to, Jesus, the, to the rabbinic law, the Jewish rabbinic law, a man could not commit adultery against his wife. He could commit adultery, but it wasn't against his wife. Adultery was against uh, um, the, another man for seducing his wife. A, a woman, on the other hand, could commit adultery against her husband for an act of infidelity. That doesn't seem very fair, does it? That doesn't seem very fair. But Jesus, in appealing back to God's creative purpose, not the oral traditions that, that of men that they had created, he brings equality to all of this. Uh, both husband and wife are equally responsible for their acts of adultery. Both are equally guilty, in other words. How's that for equality? We want equality, but I don't know if we wanted the one that says that we're both equally guilty. Here's why it's important for us, I think, to take a step back, take a breather for just a moment. Uh, you know, we're feeling a bit uncomfortable, or maybe I'm projecting onto you. Uh, and to be honest, again, it's, 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 this is a hard topic. Uh, Jesus, though, isn't here trying to deal with all the complexities and the nuances of divorce in a fallen and a sinful world. Uh, we, must, uh, we must balance you know, divorce as it happens with all of the rest of Jesus' teachings. Uh, there are times in a fallen world where divorce is necessary because at times there is uh, a great abuse. There is the reality of abandonment. There is the reality of infidelity. The point is that even though divorce in a fallen world sometimes is necessary, it's never, ever God's creative purpose for marriage. It never is. Even if necessary, there is no justification on our part. There's, there are no excuses. Divorce is unequivocally wrong, and it represents our hardness of heart against God and his creative purposes. But before you, you divorce folks feel judged in this moment, and all you folks that have uh, been married uh, for life here are starting to feel puffed up and holier than thou, uh, we, we have to remember that Jesus' teachings, again, in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman or a man with lustful intent has already committed adultery with them in their heart. The main issue here isn't this particular sin of divorce. It's the hard-hearted, sinful nature of all of our hearts. You know, in Jeremiah Chapter 3, verse 1, uh, God proclaimed this. God used this Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, uh, to apply to all the people of Israel, and I think to all of us. 
from Deuteronomy, he, what he said was, if a man divorces his wife, this is what God proclaimed in, to, through Jeremiah, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her? Would not that land be greatly polluted? You have played the whore with many lovers, and would you return to me? We are adulterers in our relationship with God. God's creative purpose for marriage is actually a picture of his relationship with us. That's why this matters so much to him. It's, it's a picture of how much he loves us and him uh, wanting to be united with us. And as God made clear through the prophet Isaiah, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way, meaning all of us have twisted it. We've twisted God's creative intention and purpose to fit our own wants and desires. Why do we seek to justify ourselves? Why are we so intent on doing it? Because I think it's we're longing for approval. We want to be accepted because approval gives us a sense of worth and a sense of importance. And we think that we can get it by making, or, you know, by get it by making excuses for our own hard-heartedness. So you divorce folks, take heart. I'm right there with you. I'm a sinner. Seeking the approval of others and justifying myself and making excuses for my sin all along the way. And guess what? We all are. But before God, we have no justification for our sin. There are no excuses that we can make. You know, verses 13 to 16 deal with the same core issue just in another way. In verse 13, we're told the crowds were bringing children to Jesus that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. So with the Pharisees and divorce, the issue was that hard-heartedness towards God and his created purposes and the attempt to justify our actions away. Uh, Here we see the hard-heartedness of our sins through the disciples. Parents were bringing their children to Jesus. They were small enough children that they could fit into Jesus' arms uh, so that he could bless them. But the disciples were were, were stopping them and were actually admonishing these parents uh, for bothering Jesus. Why? Why would they do that? Well, in the first century, in their culture, children were actually regarded as very low on the scale of importance to society. Uh, it's the kind of, you know, the be seen but not heard, but even another step to that. Uh, they just weren't of much value uh, because, uh, because they really couldn't do anything uh, to, to make yourself more important. They couldn't do anything to really benefit you in any way in your quest uh, for importance. The fact that the disciples treated them this way is even more astonishing Considering what Jesus taught them in chapter 9, verse 37. Those who were here a couple weeks ago, we talked about this. Uh, who, uh, this is what Jesus taught them. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. And yet they were taught this. And yet their hearts are still inclined towards being the greatest. Remember, that's what it had given. That's what it had sprung Jesus to even teach that. They want to be the most important. And allowing these unimportant children to see Jesus, it doesn't really help them in that regard in any way. And again, just like the teaching on divorce, the issue is a hardness of heart towards God's creative purposes. All people were created in the image of God, and therefore all people have worth and dignity. Uh, Even snotty-nosed, difficult, although cute, and adorable children. And in creation, God's command was to Adam and Eve... Be fruitful and multiply. Children are of great value, an important part of God's creative purposes. But the disciples were hard of heart in regards to God's purpose and abused their authority, obstructing these seemingly unimportant people uh, from coming to Jesus. This is why Jesus, when he saw what they were doing, was absolutely indignant with them. And he said this, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of God. They are, they are the, the creative purpose that God had in the first place. The kingdom's for children. But it's not just for children. That wasn't the only reason Jesus was saying this. For those snot, it's also for those snotty-nosed people who are difficult and troublesome and inconvenient that don't help us in any way to achieve our longing for importance. 
The disciples in their heart of hearts wanted the approval of Jesus and others. They wanted to feel like they really mattered and that they really had great value. So they used their position uh, to try to get that importance and letting these children come to Jesus to, to didn't achieve that. It actually hindered their greater purposes that were, were more mature and adult and would have a greater impact. Underneath our sin often lies this desire we have for approval, to be important, to really matter, to be of great value in God's eyes and other people's eyes, even in our own eyes. And we think that we can gain approval through our performance, through our own justification, making ourselves right with God. But we can never, we can never justify ourselves. Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Paul wrote this. Uh, he tells us that, that by works, no human being will be justified in God's sight. Yet we all keep trying to justify ourselves. We justify why we're right and of great importance and of great value. The gospel message, the really good news of all of this, uh, this morning comes in verses 15 and 16. Jesus said, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. The kingdom of God isn't something we can achieve. We can't justify ourselves into it. We can't make excuses for all of our failures. The kingdom of God is only something that we can receive. Jesus uh, uses children as his illustration here because let's face it, children are great at receiving gifts. They're great at it, right? Uh, put a present in front of a child and just watch with joy and happiness them tear it apart. Happiness and joy just oozes out of every uh, fiber of their being. Uh, until they get to the middle and they find a pair of socks. But, you know, you get the point. If they see the gift, they're excited. They're overjoyed. The kingdom of God is a present that's being laid right before each of us. It's a gift from God to us. And while we cannot justify ourselves before God, there is one who can and one who has. Romans 3, verse 23 to 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. The only thing that justifies us before God is the finished work of his son Jesus Christ for us. Jesus gave his life as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus is the free gift of God for eternal life. For it is by grace that you, through faith, that we have been saved. And it is not our doing. It's the gift of God, Paul proclaimed to the Ephesians. Our grown-up sense of self-reliance makes it more difficult for us to receive with joy the free gift of God's grace grace in Jesus. We struggle to grasp it. We struggle to grasp just how helpless we are when it comes to gaining God's approval in our lives. And so we continue to try to justify ourselves and to make excuses for ourselves and hope that it'll make us in the end feel worthy of our Heavenly Father's loving approval. But Jesus says that we must come to him as a child the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, we must come as a child, meaning we have to stop making excuses and we must stop trying to justify ourselves. We must own our own sin and rebellion and accept the fact that we are desperately lost on our own. And then just humbly receive the gift of love and grace that God has for us and his son, Jesus Christ. When we do, Jesus takes us just like a child, into his loving arms, his approving arms, and welcomes us. And when he does, we're free. We're free from the bondage of having to seek other people's approval, free from the need to justify ourselves or make any excuses for the things we've done or the things that we've failed to do because justice has already been served. Jesus has been tried, he's been convicted, and he has been punished fully for our sins. And through him, we possess the greatest gift of all, the loving stamp of approval from the only one who really matters, the God of the universe, our loving creator, 
Friends, let us stop justifying ourselves. Let us stop making excuses. Let's own our sin. Let's turn to Jesus, and let's enjoy his loving embrace forever. Amen.